It's often said that authors today are more empowered to take control of their careers and their lives than ever before. But what does that mean in practice? You'll find out today on Disruptor. From the edges of publishing, it's Disruptor, celebrating the rebels, mavericks and weirdos of the publishing industry and encouraging each of you to disrupt in your own way. Now here's your host, John Bard. Greetings, everybody. I'm John Bard. Welcome to Disruptor, episode 13 with authorpreneur Joanna Penn. I've been in the publishing world for close to 30 years, and I've seen a lot of things change, but maybe they haven't changed fast enough. And so I asked the question, are there disruptors out there? Are there people and companies that are really changing things in publishing, pushing us into the future, throwing out the old rule book and creating a new one all their own? I went in search of that, and I found them. And on each episode of Disruptor, you'll meet them. Welcome to the journey. It's time to disrupt. Today's episode of Disruptor is brought to you by Writing Blueprints, the breakthrough step-by-step system for writers that creates truly great books. To learn more about the most disruptive way ever to become a successful author, visit writingblueprints.com and use the code DISRUPT to save 10% off everything on the site. The writing world has been shaken. Meet the earthquake. Go to writingblueprints.com and use the code DISRUPT to save 10%. Writing Blueprints. This is how you write a book. As you're about to hear, Joanna Penn isn't quite so sure she's a disruptor. But what else would you call someone who quits a corporate job, becomes a best-selling author, starts a small press, becomes a social media and marketing expert, and acclaimed podcaster? And then, and here's the disruptive part, teaches other authors how to do the exact same thing. I know what I'd call her, and that's why she's our guest today on Disruptor. After 13 years as a business IT consultant in large corporations, Joanna Penn became a full-time author-entrepreneur, or authorpreneur, if you prefer, in September 2011. Since then, she's written 28 books, sold over half a million copies in 84 countries in five languages. She's become an international professional speaker and award-winning creative entrepreneur. And in 2018, she was awarded Publishing Commentator of the Year by Digital Book World. She's got an amazing work ethic, but she is in complete control of her life and her career. And through her site, thecreativepen.com, Joanna teaches other authors how to do the exact same thing. I spoke with this remarkable woman from her home in Bath, England. It's really a pleasure to have Joanna Penn with us this morning. Joanna, welcome to Disruptor. Thanks for having me on the show, John. It's great to be here. Awesome. So we always begin with a simple question. We here at Disruptor celebrate the rebels, the mavericks, and the weirdos of the publishing world. Which one of those words best fits you and why? Yeah, I, I definitely found that a very difficult question <laughs> because um, I, I don't, I don't, um, I guess I don't go with any of those words naturally. Okay. None um, of the above I, is an acceptable answer. Oh uh, well, but then I thought I would look up the definitions of these words, being a good wordsmith, and decided that the word maverick uh, does mean independent-minded, and so my favourite word is independent, and uh, so I guess I'm going to go with maverick because it's basically independent. Excellent. That leads us directly into what I would love to talk to you about today. We're trying to encourage people to disrupt in their own way. And not everyone has that, or at least cannot easily identify that disruptive gene inside them. I look at what you've done in terms of building a career as an authorpreneur and how you have acted, I think, quite properly, as if there are no limitations, as if you can design your own life as a writer, as a writing instructor, and you've gone ahead and done that. I assume that came fairly naturally to you. Is that just something, is that a reflection of who you are? 
Uh, again, it's so funny hearing a, a, a view of me from the outside because I, again, I don't see myself as particularly disruptive. I uh, wrote a book back in 2006 and uh, it was a nonfiction book about career change. I was in a consulting job that I wasn't enjoying and I wrote a book and then I thought, oh, I, I guess I need to publish it. How do you publish a book? And uh, did a bit of research and discovered how long it would take to go through the agent and traditional publishing process and kind of went well there's got to be a better way of doing this um, so I self-published back in the days before uh, before the Kindle before ebooks before um, you know before the iPhone took off before audiobooks uh, went digital and uh, yeah so I self-published back in the I guess the early early days of print on demand and ever since then I've, I've just carried on doing the thing as there have been better tools uh, so I think probably the thing that comes next naturally to me is to be independent and try and find a better way. I'm, I'm also not a very patient person. So if anything takes too long, I figure there must be a better way uh, to do it or a quicker way that will achieve uh, my goals. The, the key, I think, to, to disruption, and I do think you're, you're disruptive in the sense that you're laying down a, a, a role model, a, a template for how other authors can take control of their own uh, of their own careers. There's a feeling always, I think, with a lot of writers that they are not in control, that they need someone else's permission. They need an editor to say yes, an agent to say yes, publisher, whatever. And and here you've gone and just simply created your own career. So is that something that is inherent in you, or is it a, is it something you've learned over time? Yeah, so I think this this is a really interesting question, and I I do think there's a lot to do with demographics uh, in this because uh, when I started getting interesting in writing and publishing, it was really at a point in history when the internet and digital disruption was starting to happen in a lot of different industries. So, um, you know, I, I used to listen to a lot of uh, self-help American audiobooks, people like Tony Robbins, uh, and it, it, I was always learning, always learning. And when I was listening to some of these shows, I, I listened to podcast before they were called podcast, you know, the early days of, of audio, um, uh, streaming audio. And I just, I learned about how you could do things online in terms of making money. So I found people to emulate who were not authors, but they were using their writing to make money on the internet. So this was the, you know, 2006 to 2008, the, um, when bloggers started to make really good money. And because I was unhappy in my job, I was like, do you know what I'm going to, I'm going to get into, I want to write. So I'll write my book. I'll also blog. And I started a podcast, started on YouTube back then, um, all before I wrote, ever wrote fiction. Um, so I think for me, there's actually a book called Growing Up Digital by Dan, uh, Don Tapscott. And I remember reading that and a penny dropped around the way internet business was going to reshape the world. And again, this was the early days of, of Amazon and online shopping. <laughs> um, and so I think I, think I just realized early on how things were going to change. So I believe I've ridden a wave of what has been industry disruption but that's why I guess I don't consider myself a disruptor I just saw this coming in the same way that I now see voice first um, and AI and these really other interesting shifts that are coming um, that maybe we'll we'll talk about but I think um, that's probably the biggest thing for me is that I I voraciously consume <laughs> uh, other people's um, information and that I learn and uh, then just try and act and as you say I don't wait for permission but that's because the people that I model myself on have never asked for permission right and I would I would argue that in looking at a lot of these digital uh, innovators and even looking at people like Tony Robbins, you've modeled yourself after some pretty disruptive folks. So it's, it's natural that it's going to rub off even if you don't necessarily see it. 
Yeah, and I think it's it's just been a, a the last ten years. I mean, have been an incredible time of change in the in the publishing industry, but also with um, the empowerment of creatives. So the music industry obviously went first, <laughs> uh, and a lot of creatives found that they that the big contracts with big um, music companies, music labels, were not working out very well for them. And so indie music became a thing way before indie authors became a thing. Um, indie film the same way. So it's it's kind of a, a natural progression uh, to me that indie authors would would arise uh, in the same way. And maybe it is a demographic thing because, you know, we've, we've been in this for 30 years and a lot of the folks that have been with us since near the beginning are obviously of a certain demographic and they had the image implanted in their head of what an author is. And in their minds, an author is somebody who sits in a lovely location, maybe a cabin somewhere, and writes out, now they, you know, they used to use typewriters, but they, okay, they now they use computers, and sends off their manuscripts to a magical place somewhere in New York City, and then, you know, waits for the book royalties to come in while they work on their next project. Uh, And whether or not that ever actually was truly a reality for a particularly large number of authors, it's a reality for almost no authors now. So there is this sort of baggage from the past, I think. Um, that maybe you didn't experience or you just didn't absorb that holds people back. How do you talk somebody out of that? How do you tell somebody, look, you got to be your own savior when it comes to your writing career? Well, I think you have to be really honest with yourself about what you want. Like every author has to decide what they want. And an author who is most, who mostly wants, let's say, validation um, by a certain community, that path may still work for you. Um, Or someone who wants to win a literary prize, you know, who wants to spend 15 years writing one book uh, that may or may not win (laughs) the prize. Um, that there's no reason why you can't sit in your garret and write that book and send it off. You can still do that if that's your definition of success. But if your definition of success is, let's say, making a six figure income, then you have to do things differently. And uh, when I decided that I wanted to leave my job, I was making, you know, multi six figures. And I always and I like making good money. I I never intended to be a poor author. I was never going to give up a great career um, to be poor. (laughs) So because I, I enjoy my lifestyle. And for me, you know that some of the most famous creatives in history have been multi-millionaires I mean look at Picasso for example um so I and I mean (laughs) you look look at Stephen King (laughs) I mean you know uh, and I love Stephen King's books look at James Patterson these are traditionally published authors who also have a very good business model so you know there are ways of doing this in the old industry but you'll also see people like Nora Roberts um King Patterson Danielle Steele people who are in the bestseller um list uh all the time but also the best earning list they are all putting out several books per year and that's the other thing if you want to make money as a writer you have to be writing and regularly and prolifically and generally in a in a genre that people want to buy so uh, or you can have multiple streams of income like i do like you do um so that would be my overarching question what is your definition of success And what are you going to do to get to that level of success? So if um, one of the most popular things talked about in the indie author community is the idea of 20 books to 50K. So if you write 20 books, you can probably make around 50,000 US dollars. And it pretty much holds true per year uh, as as an independent author, self-published, not necessarily traditional. Um, And this pretty much holds true. So there's there's a number for you. Um, And it took me probably eight years to write 20 books uh, and I have other streams of income. So basically the question is, what is your definition of success? I know that when a lot of folks are are listening to this and they might've just had a big gulp at 20 books um, and also looking at the other things that an entrepreneur such as yourself does as a course of business in terms of getting yourself out there and being on podcasts and Uh, doing webinars and building products or or what have you. And the question is, how in the world do you do it? So what's, let's talk about time management for, for a couple of minutes here. How, what's your advice to someone who already feels pressed for time, but who wants to follow in your footsteps? How do you make that work from a time perspective? 
Well, again, <laughs> it comes back to your definition of success. And Tony Robbins, again, I'll come back to him because he talks about what do you want and then what are you going to give in order to get that? Uh, and so when I decided to become uh, an author for the first five years, I also did my day job. Um, so I would get up at five and write before my job because my job was um, pretty taxing. So uh, I'd be exhausted when I got home. But when I got home, I would be learning the business. I would be making podcasts. I was building my blog. I was networking. Uh, I was uh, doing all those things. Every weekend I was doing that. Um, I gave up TV and a social life for about five years. <laughs> um, and then I went to four days a week in my day job. I opted out of the career path. Uh, so all of those things are examples of giving up something in order to find time to do the thing you want to do. And uh, so I went full time in 2011. And so obviously that gave me more time. But <laughs> amusingly, it doesn't give you necessarily any more time for actual writing because as you say you have to then run the business you have to do the marketing so now as as per then I still have a similar routine but it's just a bit longer so in the morning I do creative stuff so um, whether that's creating another book or a course or um, I'm I've started audiobook narration now uh, so I might narrate some audiobooks anything in the morning is about creating assets uh, creating books creating things that are going to build my body of creative work across my life. And then the afternoon, I do things like podcasting, blogging, emails, marketing, you know, accounting stuff, all, all the stuff it takes to run a business. Um, and I also enjoy that too. And that would probably be my overarching point here. If you want to run uh, a business, if you want to be an author, a full-time author, then you do have to look at, well, what are the skills I need to run a business, not just how do I write? So the, the skill of writing and your craft of writing is a completely different hat than a running a business hat. And you have to learn. And if you enjoy learning, then this is awesome. <laughs> I'm a bit familiar with Tony Robbins too. And I know that one of the things he talks about is envisioning where you want to get to is kind of creating in your mind, this future as if it's already happened, and then working toward that. Do you have in your mind a vision of where you want to go? <laughs> it's actually a very timely question because uh, weirdly I have hit my 10 years recently and I did have 10 year goals and I hit all my 10 year goals okay. and now I'm looking for my next 10 year goals so as we speak <laughs> I'm pretty much between goals and but the point is it has it has taken me well I started what 13 years ago I started writing so this is the other thing you don't write I've got 29 30 books uh, out right now uh, as we speak um it's taken me 13 years uh, to get to where I am now I make multi six figure uh, income and where you know I I love my life I, I'm creating all the things I want to create so it's interesting now to think well what, what do I want next? Now, I don't want a publishing company, for example. I don't want to publish other authors. I, I love being a creative first. Uh, so that's why I'm looking at doing other things. I just started another podcast called Books and Travel, um, which is about books and travel, surprisingly, and <laughs> one of my other passions. So traveling more, um, doing more audio, doing more voice work. Um, these are things that I want to do as well as writing more books. But for me, my goals are very much uh, creative um, rather than like building a massive company or anything. I, I definitely don't want to do that. I'm, I'm a creative first. Yeah. I think that you've hit on something important, which is that you're not just creating a future to make money. You're creating a future that's satisfying for you. You're, you're doing it. You're not giving up um, or making compromises in terms of the way you want to live your life. I think a lot of people from the outside in, when they look at entrepreneurs they don't necessarily recognize that. They think, oh, I'm just going to be working 14 hours a day. It's going to be a nightmare. Um, you know, but, but in reality, you can intentionally create a life for yourself that suits who you are. And that's, I think, a, a key to success as an entrepreneur. Would, would you agree with that? Yeah, and I think the key to being an author uh, in this way is to think scalable income. And this is what I love about being uh, being able to do the independent route now, because it, when you work with a publisher, you basically license your rights to the publisher. And they make scalable income. <laughs> right. um, but when you publish yourself, when you run a publishing company for yourself, like I do, um, your assets become scalable. So I create an asset once and it earns me money year on year on year. And it just the money 
money grows, the more books you have. And it's just an amazing business model. Uh, so especially fiction. I mean, you create a novel and it can just sell for the rest of your life and 50 to 70 years after you die, according to copyright law at the moment. And this is why it's crazy to me that authors are signing contracts for the life of copyright, which is after they've died um, and taking very little money for it. So this is why I think if you understand, a, a lot of authors, I think, get it wrong is that they just wear that one hat, the creative hat. But if you, once you've made your art, take off your art hat and put your business hat on and think, okay, I've, my art is done, but I now have an asset. I have a business asset that will make money for me. How can I send it out in the world in the right way? And it will make money for me all over the world. Um, and yeah, send me cash in <laughs> every oh. month. And so that to me, the idea of scalable create once sell forever, uh, is, is the magical thing, um, about intellectual property assets. It's funny that you don't view yourself as, as disruptive because, you know, having been in this business so long, I can, I can kind of, on one hand, the number of people who would be, who, and it's very refreshing, who are so upfront about saying, yes, I'm a business person. Yes, I want to make money. Yes, here's my goals for making money. But also at the same time, because I, I've seen your writing instruction, you're, you, you are focused on good writing as well. Um, it, it, it comes naturally to you. It is who you are. But I'm telling you, a lot of folks listen to it and go, wow, I could do that. And that's what I mean by being disruptive. Um, yeah, well, I, I, think, I think that's, again, it, there is this movement and certainly the Alliance of Independent Authors, which I'm a member and advisor of. Our whole mission is empowering authors to understand all their stuff right. because uh, you can do it all these days. You know, I've sold books in 86 countries. I have print books. I have audio books. I have hardbacks. I have e-books. You know, I, and this is the thing. You can do all of this. And the idea of the business, um, you know, authors have always been business people but there's been this period of history again where the big companies have uh, bought up all the little independent presses I mean most of these independent presses are formed by authors mm -hmm. <laughs> I mean most agencies were partly to do with oh we've got a couple of rights let's do something with it so the idea of um, educating yourself around intellectual property rights I think is just something that has happened because of the way the publishing industry has changed in the last you know I well, I've heard from some people since the 80s when the big companies, you know, started buying up everybody. So I think it's about time that authors uh, sort of found their way back to controlling their own careers. Amen. Amen. Let's talk about marketing, because that's an area that, again, sends chills down the spine of many, uh, many an author. How would you counsel an independent author, someone who wants to create this sort of life? who is terrified by the idea of marketing themselves. Maybe they consider themselves an introvert. Maybe they just don't understand how it works. And, or they've been indoctrinated so fully into the idea that they are artists and that going out and, quote, hawking your wares, which is a phrase I've heard too many times from authors, is somehow unseemly. How do you get people out of that very damaging mindset into a place where they can really succeed at marketing themselves and their work? Uh, well, there's the carrot and the stick approach. <laughs> the, the, st the stick is, well, if you don't do it, no one else will. I mean, these days, publishers want more people who can market that, you know, and you'll be, you'll find it much easier to get a book deal if you can do some marketing. But from the other side, uh, you have to reframe it. You have to not think of marketing as a negative thing. You have to think that marketing is sharing what you love with people who are interested in hearing about it. And this is really important. Uh, like you, I've I've had authors come up to me at events and just hand me their book and go read this, you know, and I'm like, what, what you haven't even found out if I'm the right market for you. <laughs> <laughs> and by this cover, I can tell I'm not. Um, but no, I mean, for me, I'm an introvert. And uh, for me, marketing, I remember the day I realized I had to learn marketing. It was my, when I self-published that first book um, back in the days of print runs and I had all these boxes of books in my living room 
And then I looked around and went, oh, how is anyone going to know that I have all these books? <laughs> and then I started to learn about marketing and read a lot of, you know, I still read a lot of books on marketing. And it's just reframing the conversation and following ethical marketers who are interested in the same things you are. So I was very ha happy early on to get uh, influenced by Seth Godin, mm -hmm. who is a fantastic um, marketing writer, very creative and with um, a bottomless ethic that really makes it clear what good marketing is, which is basically connecting with people, being yourself, having an extraordinary product. Um, and I still follow Seth, still read all his, his books. Um, and also I discovered podcasting very early. My, I've been podcasting since 2009 and content marketing. So for me, it's about creating things that are useful or entertaining uh, or inspirational and attracting people to you and then they will buy your book. So that's my fundamental marketing principle is uh, content marketing and attracting people. So like this, this interview here, maybe someone will listen to this and decide they're interested enough to go to my website and then maybe they'll buy one of my books. And so to me, this is not push, 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 buy my book. This is how can I be as useful as possible so that someone might be interested enough to come and check me out. For folks who aren't familiar with the phrase, can you define content marketing? Well, it's putting out something that is free and useful, entertaining or inspirational so that people will find it when they're searching for stuff and uh, find you. So uh, this is, uh, you know, I, my podcast is about writing and publishing and book marketing and uh, people find it. And then sometimes they come and buy my stuff. So it's basically putting out things for free that, um, you know, so that people will find you essentially. And that could be blogging. It could be podcasting. It could be videos. Nowadays, it can also be things like image marketing on Instagram or Pinterest, stuff like that. Okay. Let's talk about some of the things you mentioned earlier about things like AI and augmented reality. And of course, audio books are, are very hot right now. But let's talk about what you're seeing on the horizon that you're getting yourself ready for coming up in publishing. Yes. So voice is probably the biggest thing. Um, I, I listen to a lot of podcasts and um, I've interviewed uh, a guy on, on my show about the voice first movement, uh, Bradley Metrock, who um, actually runs one of the publishing conferences now. And really looking at how the rise of voice search, so they, the, the stats are 50% of search by 2020, which is next year will be voice. So people talking to Siri or Alexa or Google Assistant and using speech to search for things, which is going to fundamentally change the way uh, we do our internet <laughs> mm -hmm. and also advertising. So some of the stats on the number of book sales that publishers are missing out on because they're not optimizing for voice search is, is huge. Um, also the way people are consuming content. So I'm putting all of my work into audio at the moment. I'm developing a voice brand. I already have a voice brand because I have a, a podcast, but I'm also now narrating my own audio books. I've been having voice coaching around that because I think uh, when I look at my own way of consumption, I don't read blog posts anymore and I barely um, look at social media, but I do listen to podcasts and audio books pretty much all the time. <laughs> so when I'm not, you know, if I'm out walking, if I'm doing chores, if I'm at home, I, you know, I, I mainly listen to things. And so that's the way I find books. Uh, and I read, I read, read on my Kindle, I read hardback and I read through audio. But this voice first movement is, is going to be huge. Also with um, eight, 8.2, whatever it is, billion people coming online by 2025. This is going to double the size of the existing internet market. So my other thing is I'm making sure my books are in every market. So my books are available in 190 countries and I'm using a lot of different partners for that. Um, emerging partners like Streetlib, uh, who's whole business model is based on the 2020s. So they have just, um, 
this year they're going to finish their goal of providing a publishing portal to every country in the world, which is just incredible. Um, and then uh, partners like Find Away Voices for Audio, where you can get your book into something like Storytel, which is taking over the countries that Audible has not taken over. So those are some of the things. And then I guess AI creativity. So I, I'm, I'm a big fan of Wired and uh, recently interviewed uh, a guy, Marcus de Sotoy, about the creativity and and AI, really interesting stuff around text generation by AIs, very, uh, a lot better than it used to be, and quite surprisingly so. So I'm really looking at how can I use AI tools to boost my own creativity and to boost my business in the coming world. So I am not made obsolete. So I am really, as we say, looking at the next 10 years and trying to position myself for the next wave because we, we are entering the next wave. Absolutely. A lot of folks that might be listening are just thought, wow, how does she stay on top of all of that? Um, And so I'll ask you a question. How, How do you stay on top of what's happening? What's coming next? who the people to follow are, because you've already described for us a very busy day. So, so <laughs> tell me how you actually manage to stay on top of, of what's, com- what's coming next in publishing. Well, let's make it clear. I, although this is my business as an individual person, I work with a lot of assistants. <laughs> so I, I, have, I, I don't have any employees, but I have about 11 different uh, freelancers who work with me. So I might record a podcast, but I don't edit it or master it or publish it. Um, so just to make it clear, I, when you grow your business, you can get other people to help you do things. Um, so that's one thing. And then in terms of staying on top of stuff, well, um, if you listen to my podcast, the creative pen podcast I do every pretty much every week I do a futurist segment at the beginning of my show Uh, so if you want to know what's happening um, then come along and listen to that Uh, and occasionally I'll do full-on individual uh, shows on on that then in terms of keeping up to speed on things um i listen at 1.5 speed <laughs> that <laughs> helps uh, and many people who are, who listen to a lot of audio speed up the audio so um your brain can take things in a lot faster uh i yeah i, I read and i listen i probably read two two to three hours a day uh i'm one of those uh, people the publishing industry loves. I buy 10, you know, five to 10 books a week and uh, read an awful lot. Um, and that's what I love. When I looked at what I wanted to do with my life, it is reading, writing and traveling. <laughs> so really? that's pretty much how I structure my life. Um, you think I sound busy, but actually I have enough time to start another career as an audio book narrator and stuff like that because <laughs> I... I I guess I I get things done. I mean, I, I time slot. So I run everything on Google Calendar and I time slot everything I need to do. And then um, the idea of deep work by Cal Newport, if I sit down to write, then I write. And I guess I don't allow myself any excuses. And then but when I go for a walk, so I live in, a, I do live in a beautiful area in Bath in the UK, which is amazing. Uh, I, when I go for a walk, I'll listen to an audio book. So um, a couple of audio books that have shaped me recently are AI Superpowers by uh, Dr. Kai Fu Lee, which is, will just blow your mind. <laughs> mm-hmm. um, and then I'm listening to another one called Talk to Me, which is about the rise of voice um, search by uh, James someone uh, and also another one called the future is Asian which is about the switch uh, towards Asia and you know in terms of population and technology and uh, just really trying to stay ahead of what's coming and I think that would be my overarching statement for everybody is this is not a this is not a sprint what I really dislike about the traditional publishing industry is the focus on that launch the launch week this is the most pervasive thing is everything has to happen in launch and if you don't hit the bestseller list in launch then you're you know you're screwed whereas I have a 10 20 30 40 year view on things which is yeah I don't I barely even notice when I publish a book now it just goes into the long-term machine and a lot of the thinking I do is about long-term thinking um so that's probably that is what shapes my overarching uh, business design, I guess, always thinking longer term. One of the things I love hearing when you were talking about that you're getting voice coaching, you're talking about all the books that you're buying, 
is that you continue to invest in yourself. And like you, our business is selling educational materials to people who want to become successful writers. And so we have always preached the idea that you've got to invest, you've got to keep, uh, you've got to be a perpetual student and you need to invest in, and fix your weak spots and, and enhance your strong spots. Um, again, for people who are inclined not to do that, who are inclined to say, look, I, I can't spend any money on this. I've got to just, you know, do it. It convinced them that they need to invest in themselves. Well, I think um, in, investing in yourself doesn't necessarily mean spend money. I mean, like we said, most of these podcasts I listen to are free. Um, you can you can educate yourself on podcasts and free courses if you really want to. You can go to something like the Khan Academy. Um, there are you know millions of ways. I mean, my you know, I've got ten years worth of publishing podcasts you can listen to for free. Um, you, you don't you can self publish for free. You can just try this stuff. Um, so I think that's one thing. I don't, I don't agree that money is the obstacle to learning. We still have libraries and many libraries. For example, you can get my audiobooks in, uh, in libraries. Um, if, if you want to, you can download them, you can get my eBooks, you can get my print books. Uh, so yeah, you definitely don't need to spend the money, but then I would say if any business, if you're going to run a business, well, let's say if it's a hobby. So it's either a hobby or a business. <laughs> Most yeah. people spend money on their hobbies. <laughs> yes. And if you're going to start a business, then you need some kind of budget. Because if you're going to make a quality product, then you have to invest. So I've always invested in editors who are definitely the best. Um, if you can get a good editor, it's the way you're writing will improve the most. I still have fantastic editors. Uh, also, book cover design, well worth investing in amazing cover design. Um, and yeah, training, I, I continue to take training courses, but I, I may, as I said, I mainly read and, and buy a lot of books. But again, books are brilliant because there's so little money for potentially a huge uh, change in your life. Uh, I mentioned that book. Um, oh, another book I just read, uh, The New Silk Roads by Peter Frankopan um, or Sapiens uh, by uh, Noah Yuval Harari. Both of those books have completely shifted my mindset. And they, what were they? Seven ninety nine with an Audible subscription. <laughs> so, <laughs> so that's seven pounds ninety nine. It's about nine dollars ninety nine or something. So yeah, I think um, be if you're a voracious learner, then you're going to do really well in this new world. And, they, and I'm sure everyone's heard about how AI and how um, uh, robotics and everything is going to change the demographics and the workplace over the next 10 years. Well, if you are educating yourself, you will be able to surf the changes. And that is the way we need to look at, um, at this digital age. It's all about surfing the changes. Well, we've just given our folks a whole lot to chew on. Now, I find it incredibly exciting and invigorating. A lot of the folks listening might be, a, might be feeling a little bit shell-shocked because there's so much. So let's, let's break it down, make it very easy for folks, especially those who want to get in touch with you. What's the best place for someone who wants to learn more about how you do what you do to enter your world? What, where should they go? Well, come along to thecreativepen.com, pen with a double N, and you can get the free author blueprint, uh, which goes through all of this type of stuff. You can also get free successful self-publishing um, and you can get the podcast and thousands of blog posts and articles. And it, it basically you can just, uh, you find all that at thecreativepen.com or come along to my podcast, The Creative Pen Podcast. And uh, my fiction is all under jfpen.com um, or or JF Pen on all the usual places. Uh, and I think I just should mention that we haven't really talked about it, but I, um, I am an author first and I write thrillers and dark fantasy. And that really is my sort of my main focus. Uh, I really only got into this type of thing because I just shared what I learned along the way. So my business, my creative pen business is just uh, an upshot of what happened by sharing things. <laughs> so there's another lesson for you. Also, if you have a, a quick question, the best place is Twitter at the creative pen. Wonderful. Let me end with the question I always like to ask at the end, which is, who's your favorite disruptor in history, alive or dead? Yeah, again, another difficult one. Um, but I decided to go with 
uh, Tim Berners-Lee, who is credited for the invention of the internet. Um, and uh, I definitely think that my, I know my career, my business would not be possible without the internet. Uh, so yeah, that would probably be, be mine. Yeah, I'll, I'll say amen to that as an internet business owner. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you so much. Uh, like I said, it's been a, a tremendous amount to chew on. And uh, I, I think it's wonderful that you don't consider yourself a disruptor, but I officially, the disruptor officially deems you a disruptor. You now have it <laughs> from the ultimate authority <laughs> on the subject. Uh, well, but, uh, thanks, so, thanks so much for having me, John. That was great. Yeah, it was, it was a pleasure to have you. And again, folks can find one more time the, your website address. TheCreativePen.com, pen with a double N. Thank you so much, Joanna Penn. Today's episode of Disruptor was brought to you by Writing Blueprints, the breakthrough step-by-step -step system for writers that creates truly great books. To learn more about the most disruptive way ever to become a successful author, visit writingblueprints.com and use the code DISRUPT to save 10% off everything on the site. The writing world has been shaken. Meet the earthquake. Go to writingblueprints.com and use the code DISRUPT to save 10%. Writing Blueprints. This is how you write a book. For show notes and videos, go to disruptcast.online. And to start a disruption of your own, visit writingblueprints.com to discover the most innovative and coolest way ever to write a great book. We'll be back next week. Until then, go forth and disrupt.